So how did we fall in love? Uh, I had to get over my prejudices. Sorry, <laughs> it was a bit like Pride and Prejudice. It was a bit like Pride and Prejudice, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. Ja to me, I wasn't a Christian at the time, and James, to me, represented everything I never, ever wanted to marry. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for those kind words. Yeah, so... Uh, Should we change the subject? <laughs> uh, I mean, quick, move on, move on. <laughs> no, we did, we did become friends. We became great friends, and, um, yeah, then fell in love. Simply. And you've been a part of Trent Vineyard for how long? Uh, we were... Ten years. Uh, so I became a Christian on Trent Vineyard's first ever Alpha course. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Trent was about two and a half years old when we joined. Well, James brought me along um, as a friend and um, I was exploring faith and did the Alpha course and became a Christian. And, yeah. and we both joined Tom Murphy's small group. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, and then something happened in your heart with Cardiff. Yes, well that was, go on, you tell us. What happens is, Jen normally tells the stories because I start telling stories, yeah. and then I get about two seconds in, and she's like, no, it didn't happen like that, so I'm gonna let yeah. you tell the story. <laughs> Classic man, forgets all the detail, the important detail. My story lasts about one minute. Uh, and then we God went spoke, we went. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think James alluded to it slightly last night in his talk when he said that God birthed the vision for church planting and the calling for church planting when he was actually only about 21. And I, at the time, I was studying medicine at university to become a doctor, and I absolutely had no idea of church planting on my radar at all. So when he told me that, I thought, hmm, hope you grow out of that. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we got married, and this vision... Um, and calling for church planting just kept burning in James's heart. He was on staff at Trent Vineyard then at the time, uh, doing lots of uh, ministries, he was doing youth and students and lots of other things, just training. Um, and I think a couple of years after I qualified as a doctor, a couple of years later, I felt God speaking to me about um, taking a year out of medicine and, um, well, working, stopping working as a doctor full time and doing the discipleship here at Trent Vineyard. So, and I think that was. God starting to, well, it was almost like going to the Kerif Ravine for me, God sort of saying, I need you to do this year because in this year I'm going to prepare you and speak to you about church planting. And it was over the course of that year, we read a lot of books, we talked about church planting, we got an opportunity to see lots of different churches. And it was the very end of that year at New Wine when God really birthed this, this desperate heart for the lost in me. And this realisation that if John and Debbie had never planted Trent Vineyard, then maybe I would not have a relationship with Jesus. And once I, that, the penny dropped there, I was like, okay, I get it. I get it. We need to plant churches. Oh, my husband wants to plant church. Oh, we've got to plant church. And so, um, so it, was, it was out of this God putting his heart, birthing his heart of, his heart for the lost in me that that's when I started on the journey. And then... God spoke about 16, six, 16 years later, sorry, six months later, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit of baby brain, <laughs> um, so he spoke six months later to us at our uh, UK National Leaders Conference about um, leaving in 18 months to go plant the church. Was that, was that difficult, painful? Well, it was just the, just the interesting thing was we chatted with Steve Nicholson six months earlier and he oversee all the church planting in the States, and we said, you know, if you've got any advice for us, what would it be? And he said, one piece of advice, well, he gave us a few pieces of advice, but the one, he said, timing is more important than place. And we sat there, and I remember coming out with Jen and just being like, he's got it wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, that can't be true. That can't be yeah, right. We were like, surely he, he gives you a heart for a place, and then when you can get there, you get there. Um, but he was saying, you know, from my experience, looking at sort of churches that succeed and churches that are Though as much, um, it seems to be something about the timing and hearing God clearly on when to go. Maybe it's because people are, are fully trained or they need a bit more training or the place just seems to be right for a plant. But he said, uh, you know, there just seems to be something in that, the timing. And the national leaders, they've put up just a picture of the UK with all the church plants and where, you, you know, and so they talk through the map. Scotland, there's a few loads in the southeast, some in the southwest. But I don't know if anybody's knows, noticed, but there's not a single church in Wales. Not Vineyard Church. Vineyard Church, sure. Yes, yeah, there might be a few churches in Wales. <laughs> Quite uh, a lot of churches in Wales. All 17 of them. <laughs> but uh, there's not a single Vineyard Church in Wales. Who will go to Wales? And it came out of it came out of really that 
thing of actually there's a nation. We will. We'll go to Wales. We'll go to Wales because we're not Welsh, but um, our children are now. Then was it a difficult process for you? Um, Do you know what? I tell you why it wasn't a difficult process. I don't think it was a hugely difficult process for us because I'd been waiting for a long time, and then but. The re we took a team of 18 with us, so we actually, my family came with us, and basically all our friends came with us And as when well. James says family, he does mean his entire family, so both his parents, um, who were retired and had moved about three years previously from Sevenoaks, which is just out south of London, up to Derbyshire, which is near Nottingham, to be at Trent Vineyard, and then God spoke to them really clearly. They were in their 60s and retired, and they just bought this beautiful converted barn. It, it was just stunning. And so they basically had the dream. They had enough money to live off in an absolutely amazing dream house, um, and were very happy in a new church. Could, and, and then God said, I want you to leave everything that I've given you and go and follow your son and his wife. And, um, and I think for me, sometimes, that's one of the things that's been the most profound about our story is that it wasn't just young people who had no firm roots or attachments. It was, it was James's parents who were in their 60s, and I think we sometimes think of older people getting more and more set in their ways and less likely to cope with change. But for, the, for me, they were some of the most inspirational people coming because they left everything at an age where you're supposed to be settling down and just getting ready to die. And, uh, <laughs> you know, well, no, but that's how sometimes some uh, people think Can we think cut that from the recording? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Nils, Nils, can we have a little sound in the monitors, um, if possible? Sorry, just one last thing. on Because they were older, the rest of us were all kind of late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. It actually meant that as a church, we gathered cross-generationally because of them. So often it's like you attract five, ten years either side. So it would be we're kind of mid-20s, mid-30s. But actually we have a whole older generation because they're in the church. Yeah. yeah. So... I think that we in the Nordic uh, Vineyard family, the, I, I know that there's a lot of people who uh, sense a call for church planting and maybe have made uh, several commitments in their life that they're ready to go church planting, uh, but don't know where and how to go on. Uh, in, that, in that process, which can be difficult, would you have any ad advice for us uh, to go on to, to uh, to become more precise, more aware of what the next move is? I, th I think there's two things that I would say about that. So, I mean, be, being realistic. So when God called us to, to Wales, to Cardiff, as much as anything, I think that that was strategic. Uh, so it was, there wasn't anybody else. There wasn't a vineyard expression there. Wales, obviously as a nation, three million people. And... We want to see churches planted wh wherever, but strategically, Cardiff's the capital of Wales. And if we're going to, God had always put within us a, a, a vision to plant churches. You know, if you were to cut me open particularly, it's church planting. <laughs> that's, what, that's what drives me, that's what fuels me. And so when we were going to Cardiff, it was the vision of we're creating a church to birth Wales. Do you know what I mean? Rather than it just being about Cardiff, it was like, this is about a nation. Now, on the one hand, that feels quite big, and you're like, oh, that's, that's a... That. But on the other hand, it's like, actually, that's always been within our genetic code. So from the very moment that we went, I was like, to be honest, it's never been about we want to be a 1,000 people. For me, it was always, I want to be big enough that we can plant multiply again and again and again so that we can reproduce. So for me, I think that's about 400, that you, re you hit about four or 500, and actually the church can give birth without it killing the church. I think sometimes when you're a bit smaller in the, it, it's, you know, you, you, as Tom was talking about today, actually church planting, giving away your best, we love to talk about it, and we always say give away your best. Yes, that's true, but there is a cost to giving away your best as well, because you're like, they were our best. <laughs> oh no, we've got to start again. And actually having been at Trent and knowing that process, really difficult, but at the same time, it enables a whole new generation to emerge, because actually if there isn't that ongoing transition of leadership, you just stay the same. And so it's the most healthy process because then suddenly when we left Trent, we left a hole, but then it enabled a whole generation of leaders to come up behind us that we'd been investing in to take those roles to move the church on. And actually there was a different skill set needed. 
that I was very much a generalist and they needed specialists because they were at a different stage of church and so kick, being kicked out was the best thing. But what, what you're saying is that uh, timing is more important than the place, is that? I, well, I, th I, I think so. I think when you're, you just, for us it was just like, God has spoken on that. <laughs> on one sense, you're never ready, but you're ready for the next step, aren't you? And God's given you the confidence. And so I think it's time. And then there's a strategy to it. It's like, you look at the, you know, on the one hand, it's like, we're waiting for God to speak about the location. Yes, that's true. On the other side, it's like, well, where do we need churches? There's a strategy of where are the big cities? The cities are the places that are going to, if, if you're going to reach Denmark, you probably want to plant in the five biggest cities, and then they will be church planting centers in order that you can reach the whole of Denmark. I mean, it's kind of... That's yeah, and when I Steve, I, can, I mean, I can remember exactly what he said. He said, if you're going to pray about one thing, pray about timing um, rather than place. He said, because timing seems to be the key. It's the thing that is really important to hear God clearer on. He went, you know, in terms of the place, go somewhere you want to live. Go somewhere you could bring your children up and enjoy living. He's like, just go somewhere with people because that's what God cares about cares about people, so go somewhere where there's people. And I know Rich Nathan's big drumbeat is cities, isn't it? So Rich Nathan talks a lot about bringing redemption to the cities. And, and I think actually when we look at one of the, the strategies that we're trying to do in the vineyards in terms of, in the UK in terms of planting, is that we've got a lot of small town plants and we need some cities and we need some big city churches. Because his, his uh, thoughts on it is that it's the cities that change the culture. And it's the cities that impact the nation. And the more people that are in the city, the more people you're going to impact. And so his, his big drive is, let's plant the cities, let's plant the cities. But let me ask you, so when do you stop waiting and go and do it? When do Plan we do church? it? No. Oh, oh sorry. Us. Uh, 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 when, if, you, if you have a call for church planning. Okay, can, I, can, I come, can I come back a step? I think the, the vineyard... For, in the first stage of the vineyard, it was very much, have you got a pulse? Do you want to plant a church? Yes. Great, go. Sink or swim, you know, to, to some extent. And I think, do you know what? That's fine when you're in the early stages of a movement. That's not a bad thing. You've got, you need momentum. You've got places that you need to reach. But then the reality is you start looking as, as you go on. You begin to learn lessons of where things have worked, what to do well. And you go through that process of evaluating. And so... Within, within the way that we're doing things now, we, we, we have to start thinking three to five years down the line. So rather than it being, this is a one year process, what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify, for me in Cardiff, we're, we're responsible for the west of England, the Wales, et cetera, et cetera. We, I'm looking for people five years, 10 years out, who I'm sitting there going, they've got the call of God on their lives, to be honest, do I know that they're exactly going to plant a church? No, but they, there's something of the church in them. There's a call of God in them that I want to see. So you work with a group of 30 people. The reality is maybe 10 or 15 will then go on to plant churches. Not all of them will. Some of them will find different callings and different things. But I think of, and this is coming back to the Elijah thing, it's the preparation. And, and I believe that um, we, we obviously came out of Trent. I've been on staff for seven or eight years. So when, when we planted, I had the voice of John and Debbie in my head with every decision, going, I know what they would do. Now, if I don't do what they would have done, I need to have a very good reason for not doing that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's almost like the people that you've trained under, if they're good leaders, you begin to think like they think. And so, so there was a protective mechanism that we'd seen so many things happen that actually we didn't make those mistakes. That, that's not because we're great leaders. That's because we had good training. I, I, I believe, and that we are able to or see a model of... good training makes good leaders. Yeah, good, good training. And so coming back to this idea, I just think we need to think longer term. If we're going to plant 10 churches in five years, what do we need to do to get there rather than how we're going to do it immediately? Because I think it's a long-term process. I was 21. I'm looking for people... Yes, there are older people, but I'm looking for the 18, 19, 20-year-olds... And, you know, fortunately in Cardiff, we, we've got a whole, whole load, a whole gaggle in that. And, you know, there's probably, I could see church planting on 10, 20 different people. And for me, it's just beginning to work with those people, see what's in them, what's God put on your heart, that process. Okay, so then we go, so at that point, okay, you think you might be called to some kind of church. We then, we have a hub, which we run from out of Cardiff Vineyard, which is ongoing training. 
So once a month we do training with those and the surrounding churches. And we say, if you're interested in church planting or you just feel you've got some kind of call on your life, and we just tr- teach basic stuff. You know, the, all the identify, train, recruit, monitor, nurture, deploy, all just good teaching. It then networks people with a generation of people around them from other churches. So they're like, oh my goodness, we're in something bigger than this. They're training together. Because I've noticed that actually my g- generation at Trent have all gone on to plant churches. It's 40s, 50s, 40, how old are you? 27. Um, but interestingly, all my peers, we now lead six different churches. You know, so we met up recently, we went to Centre Parks, with Chelmsford, Bath. Do you know, so we, it's almost like, I, I reckon the way God brings together groups of people and then he kind of explodes them out. And just what I've, I've noticed. And in t- James mentioned the hub. This is something, I don't know whether any of you have been around uh, the National Leaders Conference. Um, a hub is something that's been birthed over the last couple of years, started in Leicester, and it's now nationally going on in different areas. So there's a hub in Nottingham, there's a hub in uh, London, there's a hub in Cardiff, all over the place. Um, I think there's seven hubs yeah. now, the one in nine, Ireland as well, nine, nine soon. Um, and it's almost sort of standardised equipping for leaders who are called significantly to the church slash church planting. And, a lot, and there's different levels of training in the hub. You can just go along for the teaching. Uh, but if you are called to church planting, then, then you have to do the theology as well. Mm. So there's the Vineyard um, Institute theology training that you go through as well. And then we do a pre-assessment two or three years out to say, to go through all the different criteria. And then suddenly three years out, it's like, okay, these are the eight areas you need training in. You, your evangelism, who have you brought to the Lord in the last six months? Mm. Okay, nobody, that's, what you need, that's where you need to push. So suddenly we can kind of structure training straight into somebody and then coach them through that process and then on to the next process. But that doesn't quite answer your question, does it? Because you asked about when is it time for people to go? Yes, because we have, uh, we have some people that have gone through uh, the different stages and maybe just waiting for you know, the final signal or the final revelation, when to do it. And, uh, I think, uh, you know... It's a combination, isn't it? We, we do believe God speaks today and God does speak today. Um, and so it is really important to hear God prophetically. I mean, for us, it wasn't a prophetic word. It was just this sense. For, for, for us, the sort of the right, it's, it's the time was this sense of urgency. And it was at National Leaders Conference in 2007 um, when literally every session I just had this heartbeat of we've got to go, we've got to go, we've got to go, now is the time. And, the so- and the, this sense of urgency, and as soon as we could possibly go was in 18 months' time, and I'd finished my training to be a GP, and James had transitioned. Um, but So there is that sense of hearing God on it. But, you know, Tom talked about this morning about John and Anna Simmons, about leaving to plant in Chester. Now, they actually, they, he talked about his job as the, uh, as the adult bird pushing them out of the nest. So I, I think it's both. I think sometimes it's asking your leaders, do you think we can go? Do you think we're ready? And, and also, for any of you guys who have got church planters in your, in your churches, sometimes you're going to have to kick them out of the nest and say, I think you're ready. I think you've learned as much as I can teach you. And I think you just need to go. Stop being so scared. And that's what <laughs> happened with John and Debbie, with John and Ellie. Um, so John and Debbie were on staff with John and Ellen John and Ellen Yeah, the, who lead the, and um, John and Debbie have been talking and, um, and Debbie John and Debbie are senior pastors Senior so pastors and, and they've, been, they've been talking mm-hmm. together and Debbie's like, I think we need to go John, John Wright turned around to Debbie and said well it would have to be John Mumford asking us to go anyway and <laughs> a couple of months later John Mumford It was a week later It was, it was a, a week, week later, later came around and said guys, do you know what, I think it's time for you to go Very so, so, it's that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's a bit of hearing from God, asking your leaders, and if you are a leader, sometimes saying, I think it's time for you to go. God has obviously got this on your life. Do you know what I mean? What are you doing about that? Yeah. So why don't you uh, tell us a little about uh, what God is doing in Cardiff Vineyard? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, it's funny. You're asked that question, and it depends what day you're asked that question, doesn't it? <laughs> So it depends whether you just had a pastoral issue kick off and you're like, oh, yeah, today we're all right. No. So um, do you know what? We, we feel really blessed. We've been through different seasons of the church. I think we're in a season at the moment where we are feeling the Lord's blessing on us. We're growing as fast as we've ever grown, you know, in terms of, you know, when you look around the church, you're like, I don't actually know 
quite a lot of these people. So it, it's kind of reached that stage, um, which um, is, a, is a great stage, but growth brings with it stresses and strains as well. So training that next wave of leaders, more staff, bringing on more staff and those kind of things. But I think what we're really excited about is um, beginning to explore different models or, and different ways of doing church across Wales as well. So we've got a couple coming to us two hours away from West Wales, so we're planting a small group with them in September, two hours away, and beginning to see what happens there. It's like, and another couple are moving out to be with them. We've got something going in Ponty, which is half an hour away. It's another town, and our worship leader lives there. And he and he says, you know, I'm really passionate about Cardiff Vineyard, but I live in Ponty. This is this is where I live. This is the people that I want to reach. And he's got the gift of evangelism. And so there's a local coffee shop. He's just started inviting back because he's our worship leader. He knows musicians and bands. He's just started hiring hiring that out once every couple of months and doing testimony and band night. And you know they're having 70, 100 people coming along. You know just from the local area. And it's just started this. It's a smaller town, and people are talking. They got the radio to talk about it. And so suddenly it's this kind of expression of people hearing about Jesus, hearing stories about Jesus in this place. It's sowing the seeds. We want to plant a church there. We're not there yet. But in some sense, we're just, we're just breaking the ground at the moment and, and beginning to see that happen all over the place. And one of the things, we really, we changed our small group system about six months ago. Um, and that's just enabled a whole load of creativity in the church that we didn't, up to that point, have. Because if your small group system isn't outward, your church isn't outward, <laughs> underlyingly. And so we were asking the question, because I think there's a degree to which we've always been quite an outward church. I think we're quite good at gathering, partying. But we were like, oh, our small group isn't as outward as we like it to. And so we spent nine months looking at our small group system and saying, what does our small group system actually achieve? How is it doing what we think it's doing? And what is it doing? And or just asking, evaluating all those questions. And so we were like, we need to make more outward groups. And so suddenly we messed with it because we want to pick up our fringe. We want to pick up the lost. We are about reaching people. We've got lots of leaders. How can we get them outward focused? So, it's, so we, we, went to the, we went to the church on it and did this long process of changing. And, and that's just been amazing to see people signing up into your small groups who have no faith. I mean, yeah, suddenly so you're like... We've got quite a lot of people who were really on the fringe of the church, who are really engaged in community, and, and actually quite a few people who have absolutely no faith, who are coming along to a small group, because it's like a craft small group or a basketball small group, um, because they... I think we looked at our small group and thought... I mean, I remember being a, becoming a new Christian for the first time and going to a small group and just going, this is really weird. You know... It's only Christians that sit around in a group of people, most of whom you don't know at the beginning, and talk about intimate things going on in your life. And I was like, this is weird. And so I, it, it took me a while to feel comfortable and get what small groups is all about. So, so how, in what way has it changed now? So if we, if we come to one of your small groups, what is different? Well, <laughs> we, we actually, there's a book called Activate uh, that we well, read. Let, so we have... Four different types of small groups now. So we have our traditional community groups. We have our outward groups, which are running groups, football groups, craft groups. Basically, the idea is whatever will gather people, and then will they have spiritual content, some kind of spiritual content, but really around what people's passion is. You know, mountain biking. You know, and it's what the leader carries into that environment that's what important. You know, I talked about what you carry. So setting the speech of spiritual culture within these. Ideas. We do courses so that we can do more training, you know, like Kingdom of God course, Bible course, Bible in a Year, um, marriage course, parent. We just launched the parenting course, the marriage course, pre marriage course. You know, so we have a whole load of courses that are alpha, beta, that all fit within our core uh, structure. And uh, then we have student groups. So we have about 24, 25 groups. Um, but suddenly, we're saying to people, what do you need to grow? What is it that you need to grow? Do you need to be in a group that's going to reach out? Okay, well, how can we help that? How can we help that to happen? And so and the, the other thing we've gone to is sign up. So in the past, we, we were always like, oh, people just come along, just give somebody a ring and see how you're going to get in a group. The reality is that's fine for people who are quite proactive, but the majority of people aren't. We've made that process quite difficult. Uh, go to a house where you don't know 
but so we moved to 12 week terms and we launched small groups all at the same time. So we create all these new groups and suddenly we've got just loads of people signing up for groups. Probably we went up about 70 people in our small groups, um, 70 more people in small groups than we had before. Because uh, Jen, Jen always said, because she'd come from the place of not being Christian. I, I've always loved traditional small groups. It's never been an issue to me. I'm like, I don't understand. You know, it's like, I think they're amazing. Like, and, and Jen said, it's the first ladder on the run. It's almost like sometimes it's really difficult for people to get on the ladder of a small yeah, group. Yeah, so uh, I community. think if you think about sort of getting into community and growing in faith, I think if you make that first step onto the rung of the ladder really high, then not everyone can get onto the ladder. So once you're on the ladder, it's easier then to get up to the next rung. But I said, I think that first, I think that first rung of the ladder is high. And I think as a new Christian or someone who's not really been in church very long will struggle to get onto that first rung of the ladder. So if we can make our small groups easily accessible, then that'll help them to get into community. And the more that when they join a small group, they get to know some people. So they know more people in the church, which means they are more comfortable in community, which means they're more comfortable in church. And so it was just trying to make a small group as accessible as possible to everybody, not just the diehard Christians. But we have ratios. So we have ratios of 60% community groups, 20% activity groups, 20%, um, what's the last one, activity, community, courses. So that every term we are sitting there going, what's the ratio? Do you know what I mean? And the community groups are year, year long groups that keep going, and the other ones are shorter groups. But we've moved into, yeah, sorry, yeah, quite a lot of information. That change of culture. It's church changed culture. the church, because to change your structures, Tom talked about that again this morning. He said, sometimes you have to change your structure in order to change your culture. And that enabled, because we've got so many creative, gifted people, it was like, sometimes we don't feel like we're using these people. We've got teachers who are like, do you know what, I don't want to lead a never ending small group. But I am called to teach. Do you know what I mean? They can teach the Bible brilliantly. So we were suddenly saying, can you teach us a 12-week course on hermeneutics? And they're like, absolutely. And then people can go along to that thing. So suddenly we're enabling gifting in people that wouldn't necessarily have been recognized as the people that we would have always had doing things. Um, Very interesting. So uh, you're... Sorry, it's a tangent, but no, no. if you want to know more... I, I thought I would ask you, do we... Did it go very smooth, this change? But we don't want to face the path. Yeah, and, uh, well, do you know what? It went incredibly smoothly, but we took a long time talking this process through and saying, what is it that we want to be as a church? And I think that really feeds into kind of culture, doesn't it, Jen, in terms of how you change the, how you begin to change the culture, how you do identify the culture that you are, and then how you move on from there. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You are both involved in the UK uh, leadership group and uh, particularly alongside with uh, Juliet and Steve Barber uh, with church planting. So could you tell us a little about how, how uh, is the UK via um, stirring up church planting? Just a snapshot. Round overview, yeah, snapshot of it. Yeah. That's a big question. Just trying to get my... Um, we had a meeting about three years ago where John took away a number of us to look at what was happening in the movement and to say, okay, imagine what could be. Do you know what I mean? It's like, this is where we're at. It, it's good, it's fine. But where does the Lord want us to be in 10 years' time? And so he, he took us actually to the Gherkin in London, which is this amazing building. And we were on, and we, it's just an inspiring place to start thinking about vision and dreams. And, and so we just had this, uh, and so we, we came back and we prayed about it and we were just like, okay, this is, um, this is what we think the Lord's called us to. And that's 2010, and it's the 2020 vision of we want to see another hundred. We want to double the movement in 10 years. And so went back to the churches and asked them to think about, you know, how they're going to church plan and what they're going to commit to. Well, that changed everything. <laughs> you know, I, I think suddenly having this this vision of what we wanted to see the Lord do, then we had to. As soon as you have the vision, then you have to go. Well, how are you actually going to do this? How are we going to actually plant after churches in 10 years? Does what we, if we carry on at our current rate, where will we be in 10 years? You know, sometimes you have to look, well, if it's, we're planting three churches a year, we will be here, we'll be like 130 churches or whatever. So what do we need to do in order to plant more churches and how are we going to raise and stir up church planting? 
Because I think sometimes it's easy as a movement to be reactive to the things in front of you, isn't it? You know, there's all these different things coming. And sometimes in your, and as a leader, you know, I, I know as well as anybody, even in, as, as we're leading our churches, we're reacting to the people and to the crisis rather than we're getting on the front foot. We're saying, actually, God, what is it that you want to put? So it was almost, I, I feel like it was a shift from sometimes being on the back foot to going, okay, let, now let's get on the front foot and go, what does the Lord want about how are we actually going to do this? And so Steve's been doing that for years, and, and we came on board with Steve. And really, it was this is when hubs came alive, because we were sitting there going, how are we going to train people? What's our training process for church planters? Because if we're going to plant these, we've got to train them better. And so hubs kind of came out of that system of, okay, what, what would it mean to, what would we want our church planters to know? What would, if we, if we were going to sit there and kind of write a curriculum and say, well, you need to know this, 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 this. So we sat down and we were like, this is what we think church planters should know before they plant churches. But you, you have done, you have taken another initiative before that. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. With Cause to Live For. It. Yeah, with Cause to Live For. And John asked me and Jen to head up some of the 20s and 30s stuff in the UK. And uh, I think we actually went to John and said that we think there's a bit of a gap with stirring up the 20s and 30s, is that we have our National Leaders Conference, which is great, but the majority of them don't go because they're not already leaders. We need to get to the ones who aren't yet leaders to inspire them about what could be. And so we started Cause to Live for three years ago. And really with this intention of, it's like a big funnel of, well, I started connecting with all the churches in the UK and saying, you know, who are your young people? Would you bring them along to this? And, you know, so I think there were, last year we, you know, had six or 700 20s and 30s together. Just with that intention of underlying, it's not just about church planting. It's about calling and who you are and identity. But underlying, there, there, there is a church planting edge to it as well. Because we, So we use that as the first funnel with our 20s and 30s, and then that feeds into, okay, if the Lord's spoken to you, why don't you think about joining a hub? Why don't you start training? Then that leads into coaching, which is, okay, once you've felt that, okay, you think that you're called, we do an assessment with them, we then coach them into, okay, the next two years you're going to need this to go through, you need this training, boom, boom, to the point where they plant and then co coach them after they plant for the first couple of years before they become an established church. So it's, it's, it's just that joined up process that we've moved. It sounds good when you say it, we're still working on it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's still in process, but this is, this is what we want to get to. And then also within the, okay, having potential national day for church planting within our church to say, actually, when you stop and think about it, but the future of the movement depends on planting good, strong, healthy, vibrant churches. And therefore, it's easy for us to take our pedal off, the pedal off it. And so we were just like, we, we need to put the foot to the floor again. There's a lot more we still need to do, but this is where we, we're moving to in our thinking. And it's beginning, and what's happening is we're beginning to see the fruit of that process. Because it's a longer term thing. It takes three years before you begin to see the churches go out. Uh, and what do you look for uh, when raising new and young leaders? Many. Th <laughs> I, think, I think it's the, for me, this is, in some senses, that, that process is a little bit further. But it's, it's when I meet somebody, I generally try and take them for coffee two or three times in order that I can begin to ask what's on your heart. So until I know what's on somebody's heart, then if we're not careful, we can only think, sometimes we only think through a leadership grid in terms of the church, which I think is massively important, and I think we need to do that. I think we also have to think about discipleship and leadership in the world as well. So there's, there's the two sides of that. So when I'm meeting with somebody for a coffee for the first time, it's like, do you know what? Again, what I talked about, what are some of the things that are on your heart? What, what, and how are we going to help you to be all that you can be within that place? Now, we, as you start having those conversations with people, then suddenly it's like, oh, okay, so, oh, that's really interesting. God's got youth ministry on your heart. Oh, that's fascinating. So what happens is, for me, I almost begin to have this data bank, <laughs> you know, these different files of youth work, and, and try, in that process of just trying to identify people. Um, so for me, I, this is just the way that I mentor and train, is that I have different lists of people. So I have lists of people almost that I want to meet up for the first time. It's almost like I've seen them across the room, there's something there, and then I'll just be like, let's go out for a coffee, I want to know more about you. And literally, for an hour, I just quiz them. It's like a, 
an interview. <laughs> it's not an interview, but it's like, I just want to get to know you to find out what's in you. Uh, and then sometimes I'd pass that person on. Do you know what I mean? I'd be like, you need to meet up with this person because you, youth's on your heart. You need to go and speak to our youth minister or, you know, business is on your heart. Okay, we've got a whole load of people in business. We need to go and speak to them. Sometimes, possible. sometimes this is where the second list comes in, it's almost like you keep people and you're like, there's something really interesting that I really... And so it's kind of like maybe every three or four months I'll touch base with them. And, and this is where you say, well, what are you looking for? I'm looking for somebody that wants to learn, that's teachable and is beginning to know what's in them. And this process happens from somebody who's just come to faith. Sometimes somebody who's just come to faith, the leadership gifting is so strong in them that they're, they're already, they're, they're in your church and they're already leading. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh my goodness, you're leading. And you're kind of behind the curve on them because they're already leading. Um, so it's kind of having these multiple, and then I have kind of an inner group of people that would be much more intentional mentoring. It's, it's like, actually, it's once a month touching base. So almost these three categories. But I think the real difference for me has been learning to train my staff and my leaders to be able to do the same same thing. So it's one thing to be able to do it to yourself. Well, the church got to a couple of hundred and suddenly I was like, I think I'm dying. I am dying, you know, because it's like, I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not reaching the people anymore. And so suddenly I had to go into a completely different role. So I've just got to train people to do this. And to be, because I remember Tony Jen, I was like, I'm really frustrated that other people aren't doing this. And Jen was like, well, have you taught them to do this? No, just expect them to be able to do it. And so just that training process with people has been so helpful. Um, yes, so I think it's, it's that process. And then there's obviously the Heibel stuff, character, chemistry, competence, culture would be what culture do they, I'd add that one, what culture do they carry around them as well, what's in them, what are they doing to develop. Um, but yeah, so those things. But I think that we have to get to know people. And I think sometimes that we, we want it to be within a system. But actually that one-on-one, -on -one, I've started um, training more in groups of three and four now as well. I found that really helpful because iron sharpens iron and having a whole group of three or four guys together in that environment, suddenly it's like, okay, you can begin to form them in a group and then they're accountable and they're not all looking to you for that input. As to, to, to just to very practically, if, you sit, if you're here today and you, you sense you have, a, you have a, some calling to lead, yeah. How do I get on with it? How do me, I grow? Yeah. Well, the first, it, it's what I, and this is what, sometimes we're called out, aren't we? Somebody calls us out. So for, for me, it was Tom. He called me out. He saw something in me. And he was like, I want to hang out with you. And he spent time developing me. Um, sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes we have to be proactive and go to our leader and say, do you know what? I really want to learn. I want to learn how to do this. And so not always waiting to be asked. You, you know, I think that there's actually people, leaders succeed because they're pushy. Do you know what I mean? It's a, the, to a certain extent that they're like, do you know what? And so for me, you know, even now, I look around and go, you know, I'm at the beginning of this journey. Who are the people that can teach me the next bit that I need to know? So there's a guy, Andy Smith, he leads the Belfast Vineyard. Yeah. About a year ago, I turned around to Andy and I said, do, do you know what? There's something in your life with God and the way that you pray that I want to learn from you. Do you know, I don't have that. I don't have that, what you've got. I want what you've got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said, can we hang out in order that I can learn what you've got in that area? So you as a leader, what questions do you want to hear from people who are, you know, realizing they have this leadership gift or they want yeah, to so I want, I, I love it when people come to me and they're like, do you know what? I really be feel, feeling the Lord's beginning to stir me about leading more. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like, fantastic. Okay, we, yeah. we've got you now. Yeah. And... Um, so within our, within our church, we have a discipleship year, which we've, um, which we've started because we want to train, train multiple leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, we want this process to be happening. So we had 12 on the discipleship year um, last year, eight this year. So you've got that first wave of beginning to intentionally train people and then you give them mentors and all that. That leads into an internship, you know, and then staff, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, when somebody comes to me and they say, train me, I'm like, Amazing, <laughs> yeah. um, most of the time. <laughs> and then what happens is we test whether they're really serious about that and we say, okay, if you're really serious about this, I want you to go and do this. Mm. I want to give you something. Will you go and join the youth team for six months? Yeah. And if they don't, it's like, well, you're not serious about being trained. Do, do you know what I mean? So the, the, there's a degree to which, and again, 
I think that we, if somebody's coming to you saying that, give them a high bar. It's like, okay, fine. Mm. Do this. And then when they, you know, you might catch up with them three months later, and it's like, well, how, how are you getting up? Well, you never did that. Well, are you really serious about learning? Or are you not? <laughs> I think that we have that opportunity when somebody's coming to us and say, okay, great. Show me that you're serious. Because I've got a guy who's in, a, who's in the States at the moment, one of the most gifted, I think he's a phenomenally gifted leader. And uh, he, he rang he rang me up recently, you know, just talking about the talking about the future. And I'm like, do you know what? I need three to five years with you. If you're serious about this, you need to commit for three to five years. And I can't promise what that's going to look like, but I'll look out for you and I will train you, but I can't do that in four months. Hmm. So if you're serious, come and commit. Um, so how do you get up the time for all this? And Jen, you're, you're a part-time doctor. You, you, you have three little children, you're bivocational, uh, planting and leading a church at the same time. How do you do it? <laughs> um, I think the first thing that I'd say is that, <laughs> um, I don't, firstly, I don't do as much as I think people think I do. <laughs> I think someone like, oh, you like work as a doctor, and you do this and you do this, and I'm like, ah, I work two days as a doctor. And I'm not actually paid for the church. So I don't have any paid protected time for the church. Um, so firstly, I don't, I don't do as much as I think people think I do, just to bring myself down a notch. And secondly, I, I get it wrong a lot. Um, sometimes I spend too much in one area and not enough in another. And I think a lot of the time I feel like I don't do anything very well. And I think that's often the way that people who are bivocational or are juggling lots of balls, I think probably all mothers feel that. Um, I'm a rubbish mother, and I can't do this, and I can't even wash clothes properly. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, so it's, I think it's just difficult. It's difficult doing lots of things. And I think when you're first, l luckily, I think James went, within a, a year, James went um, to be paid by the church as his only job, which is quite unusual. I think a lot of people spend quite a while being bivocational, getting a church going. And it's a really difficult thing to do because work can sometimes be all-consuming and certainly church can be... I mean, ministry just never ends, does it? So I think one of the most important things, and we've all heard this, is, is putting in boundaries and, and just really sticking to them. Because we all know it's important to put in boundaries, but how good are we actually at sticking to those boundaries and saying, well, we're not going to talk about church tonight, or we're not going to do this all weekend because we need to spend some time with our kids because our kids are going to hate ministry and hate church and therefore hate God if we just spend all our time and family meals talking about church. Um, so I think, obviously, boundaries is one of the most important things. I think there's two other things. Um, one is is knowing that you can only do what you can do. Um, and yes, we want to we wanna change a nation, we want to plant loads of churches, and we want to do it tomorrow. Um, but you can only go as far as you can go. So you can only do what you can do. And I think, I think one of the things that's, that's sometimes dangerous about ministry is that this is all-consuming need to sort of save the world now. Um, and if we burn out and our families fall apart, and our relationship with our spouse falls apart, then we're no good to anybody, and we're probably ending up with a lot of people on the sidelines hurt by church and hurt by God in the process. So I think just knowing what pace you can do life is a really important thing. So just going a bit slower. So if, you're, if you need to spend more time with your family and more time with your marriage in order for the rest of your life to be healthy, then maybe you just need to go a bit slower. So I think sort of giving yourself permission to go at the pace that you can go at, rather than having to go at the pace of saving the world tomorrow. Um, so I would say that that is one thing. And and the other thing is, I mean, I mentioned I, I don't work, I don't, I'm not pay, I don't have any paid time for the church. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't influence in the church. Um, I think what I've what I've learned over the time is 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 that I don't have a huge amount of time. But I do have the opportunity to influence the church in an extremely significant way. And so I'm quite strategic with how I spend my time in the church. So when I'm going to be there on a Sunday, I'm there. I'm really visible. I do the notices. I sow values through the notices. So every now and then I will talk about why small groups are really important, why, why giving is worship to God as part of the notices. So I'm really visible on a Sunday. I lead the ministry time with James and pray for people. 
Um, and I think one of the other, th well, I do small, we do uh, leaders meetings together and newcomers together. So I meet all the new people in the church, I touch base with the leaders regularly, um, but I don't have any paid time. But I think one of the things that we've learned over time leading together is, is knowing what we carry. Um, and James is really good at sort of um, people and vision and having the conversations and birthing ministry. Um, but I think as time has gone on, I've, we've both recognized that actually God's given me a strategic gifting. And so really only in the last year have we realized that. And so once a week, we spend about an hour just talking about being more proactive in the church rather than reacting. So uh, James mentioned a little bit last night about how he gave me permission to say some things <laughs> to him. Um, and one of the things I said to him was, you're a really reactive leader. And I think in order to grow into the next level of leadership, you need to start becoming a, re a, a proactive leader. So rather than just fighting fires all the time, I think you need to start working out where you're gonna go. So, and James just talked about that in terms of training the leaders. So I said, you can't get annoyed at people for not doing it right if you don't teach them how to do it right. So we've put in, um, we've put in a series of teaching sessions for our staff team and also our leaders meetings over the next year or two and identified what are the things that our leaders need to grow in, what are the things that our staff team need to grow in and we need to teach them because we can't get annoyed at people for doing things that we've not taught them how to do. Um, and so it's just, it's, I think, just knowing what I carry and, and luckily that is something that I can do in about an hour in a week, just talking things through with James. Um, Call it my meeting with Jen, where I come away with a very big to-do list. <laughs> but having said that, it's the most helpful thing I do because she has got, and actually what protects us is Jen's strategic gift of time. So I think there's a real gift, isn't it, to say, I can't do everything, but I can do this, this, and this, and I'm not going to do any of that because I can't. And actually, the family's my priority in this, in this area. You know, so we've brought our kids here because it's a priority to have our family. So we make a decision on our family. If we're going to come, we all come. You know, so it's just something like that. But those are the things that we've put in place to protect and to do this for the long haul rather than a yeah, couple so, of years. So it's going back to that thing of we need to change the world tomorrow. Well, <laughs> we do, but we do it as a ginormous community of God, don't we? And, and so just going at the pace that we can go. So it's, it's a tension of doing as much as we can, but doing what we can and not doing more than we can. Because if we do more than we can, we And explode. also knowing your capacity. I think that's what's really fascinating about people is they have utterly different capacities. And even within this room, it's like, and the things that energize you and the things that don't. So I could sit down and meet with 12 people back to back and that will be the best day that I've ever had. For some of you, that's your worst nightmare and you're like, I've met one person, I'm so drained, I need to go and do something. Do you know what I mean? It's, we all have different capacities and it's knowing, well, what is my limit? What are my capacity? What energizes me? What, and that comes back to knowing who we are, what we carry, and then suddenly working within that of, okay, this is what I can do. Coming to an end with this uh, interview, um, Pressing on with church planting and raising leaders, what's your best encouragement for us as uh, individual churches and as a, a Nordic vineyard family? Um, I spoke to Fleming this morning, actually. I, I want to call it a prophetic unction. <laughs> but I don't know whether the word unction translates. Maybe a sense, maybe a prophetic sense. Um, James and I, over the last um, year, really, have been reading and, and thinking a lot about culture. Um, I don't know whether you guys have, have sort of done any sort of thinking or teaching on culture, but um, culture is something that, every, we think about culture being something like arts, don't we? Arts and music and lovely things. But actually, uh, culture is very different from that. It's, that's the surface. But culture, we have, you have culture, a culture in a family, a culture in a church, a culture in a nation, and. We've been around um, a few countries recently in different churches and just been, I think, you know, when you go to a new country, you are aware of differences in a country. So you ask lots of questions. Oh, do you do this? And do you do that? Oh, oh, you don't. Oh, oh, we do that. And so you're, you ask a lot of questions to find out where you're similar and where you're different. And that, for me, that's what culture is, is the deeply held beliefs that as a nation or a family or a business or a church, 
you have that then interpret into behaviours and actions. So you can have different types of, you can have positive cultures and negative cultures. So, for example, in the church, you can have a really welcoming culture. So you're really friendly. It's a friendly culture, which means that anyone coming in the doors will feel really welcomed and loved. You can also have... Um, uh, Tom talked a little bit about mistakes that leaders make. You can have a controlling culture, which should be a negative type of culture. And in a controlling culture, that's where leaders bounce. So anyone with leadership tends to bounce from a, a culture that's quite controlling because leaders need to have a, an expression to, to grow and to lead. They need to they have this sort of inability, this ability or innate desire to use their gifting, as we all do. Um, anyway, that's a bit of background about culture. Um, <laughs> So my, my feeling is having, you know, I look at, I look at different, I've looked at a few different cultures recently in sort of America, you think, oh, they're really sort of, you know, outgoing and loud and confident and hello. Um, and in Britain, we're a bit more reserved and hello. And here's my hand. I'll give you a handshake. I'm not going to give you a big sweaty hug. Um, and I think coming to Denmark, I just felt especially... Uh, well, for the Nordic regions last night, that one of the cultures that you have that we love so much is that your humility, you are such a humble people, um, you're very respectful of the individual and um, just really uh, gentle with people. I think that's my, some of my sort of early impressions. Um, and I think in the past there's been things that have happened in the Nordic region that have maybe um, reinforced the humility and sort of um, playing yourself down a little bit. But my sense is that God wants you to stand in your authority a bit more. He's given you spiritual authority. He's given you leadership. He's given you a name in the Nordic regions. And I think God wants you to start stepping into your authority a little bit more. Well, a lot more. And there was a word given this morning, a picture about, um, and it just really sort of, for me, encouraged me to, to sort of give this because it was along the same lines that there was this image of a whole load of wounded uh, people wearing rags but actually God saw you as an army and and I was like yes yes I think that's true and I think that in some ways the the Nordic vineyard has been in, in the hospital for a little while but I feel like God is trying to encourage you to go you're an army now it's time to become an army and as well sorry I'm going on oh, no, no, <laughs> But one of the things that I particularly love about um, the Nordic regions is your, is your creativity. Now, you might not think this, but as a Brit, one of my favorite things, all my favorite things, creative things, are Nordic. So um, my favorite kids' clothing company is Nordic Kids. In fact, my daughter's wearing a little Nordic Kids suit today, and my favorite kids' toys are designed in Denmark, and my favorite furniture. <laughs> I'm not going to say the word, but <laughs> you know, you're, you're so creative, you have an, I think God has gifted actually the whole of these nations with creativity, and I think that's not just designing, but it's in songwriting, and I feel like, I was saying to Fleming today, you, in terms of the vineyard, maybe you've borrowed a lot of American, Australian, and British um, influence in terms of church, and I feel like you have, you have, um, you have a global opportunity to influence and I feel like God is saying stop borrowing and start creating I've given you a gift of creativity as a as a couple of nations and I want you to use that and I want you to bring to the global stage your creativity the gift that I've given I want you to stand and put your head above the parapet and birth creativity to the to the globe so I want to be singing some some Danish and some Swedish worship songs in a couple of years please <laughs> but uh, yeah so this sense of don't stand back. Stand in your authority. Use the gifts that you've been given. And, yeah. So why don't we do that now yeah. and end it with that? And, uh, and why, uh, why don't you just stand? And we just want to pray yeah. the release of creativity over you.